International Solar Alliance, an alliance of 121 sunshine countries which lie either completely or partially between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, was launched at the initiative of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in November 2015. Its aim is to promote the use of solar energy and reduce dependence on fossil fuels. It's headquartered in Gurugam, India, and one of the organization's three official languages is Hindi, India's national language. You probably never heard of the International Solar Alliance, but in the near future, it's likely to play as important a role in the world economy and in meeting the energy needs of the world as OPEC does now, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. According to the International Energy Agency, India is already the cheapest place in the world to produce solar power given its sunny climate and cheap labor costs. India has big green ambitions and plans to invest about $500 billion over the next eight years in this space. If it goes according to plan, it would have far-reaching implications for India's national security and greatly boost global efforts to reduce global warming. Let's see how India is about to become the next Saudi Arabia of solar energy and ultimately a green superpower. The Earth intercepts a lot of solar power, 173,000 terawatts. That's 10,000 times more power than the planet's population uses. India making this move could be pivotal for the whole industry and for the whole world. It's astonishing, but clean energy from the sun, solar energy, has become the cheapest way to generate electricity. It's even cheaper than coal. For India, renewable energy is the new source of oil. Extreme weather events with increasing frequency. Its impact is only too real for India. Climate change and its devastating effects is no longer a theory. India plans to achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2070. Besides this, Mr. Modi underpinned that goal with two specific targets for 2030 to slash greenhouse emissions by a billion tons from the current trajectory and increase non fossil power generation over threefold from roughly 150 gigawatt to 500 gigawatts. If these promises that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has made in Glasgow in 2021 are kept, they will not only boost global efforts to curb global warming in a big way, but also make India a green superpower. India's entire generation capacity, both clean and dirty, is currently only 400 gigawatts. For comparison, America's generation capacity is over 10 times that, at 4,116 gigawatts. So Mr. Modi wants to build a whole second grid worth of green power in just eight years. To reach that goal, India will need to invest some $500 billion or about $65 billion per year over the next eight years, according to an estimate by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. It is not the first time so much green power generation capacity was built in such a short time. China did something like this when it went from 44 gigawatts of solar capacity to 300 gigawatts in six years, and from 50 gigawatts of wind to 330 gigawatts in 11 years. But India does not have a huge manufacturing base like China, and Indian government cannot order businesses to invest in particular sectors like the Chinese Communist Party can. Though the capacity of new solar, wind and hydropower plants constructed last year was nearly double that of new coal-fired plants, investments in renewal is not proceeding fast enough to meet Mr. Modi's plans. Can India achieve these ambitious goals? To answer that question, let's try to understand the motivation behind this plan. India was not morally obligated to cut its greenhouse emissions. At least it does not bear the brunt of moral responsibility. India is not responsible for the stock of greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere that is causing most of the global warming. Yes, it is currently the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, but a distant third. China emits 11.5 metric tons per year, United States emits 5 metric tons, and India 2.5 metric tons. On a per capita basis, India's emissions at 1.9 tons per year are a fraction of America's 15.5 tons and China's 4.93 tons. Of course, India wants to help fight climate change and leave behind a hospitable earth for the next generation. 
situation. But that is not the only reason India is doing it. There are at least three other reasons. Europe is already bracing for what could be a long, cold winter because of Russia's war on Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin has cut off gas supplies in Europe because they imposed economic sanctions on Russia when it invaded Ukraine. Europe grew increasingly reliant on Russian gas because it was convenient and got two-thirds of its gas from Russia. Germany gets more than half of its gas and about a third of its oil from Russia and is suffering now big time. That instability, Ollie, has just sent natural gas prices in Europe spiking. They are roughly nine times what they were last year and must be hurting businesses and households by now. Europe is de-industrialising. European factories have been shutting down furnaces and keeping production to a minimum. Why? Because of the soaring cost of energy. Uh, feeds into, into everything that we're seeing when it comes to the products that we're buying at the supermarket, for example, just requiring higher input prices. Ultimately, gas is used in order to produce fertilizers, so that's why we are seeing a lot of those food prices actually shooting up. Three million people could be tipped into absolute poverty in the UK as a result of rising energy prices. This reliance on other countries for its energy needs is a great strategic vulnerability for Europe and also for India. India is the sixth largest consumer of oil in the world and imports 70 to 75 percent of its oil and gas needs, costing it 4 percent of its GDP. Such imports are especially expensive when the Indian rupee weakens against the US dollar, like it has recently. As long as you are reliant on other countries, you are not free to do what you want to do even if you think it is the right thing to do. We can see that clearly in India's response to the Russia-Ukraine war. Even though as a democracy, India supports Ukraine and condemns Russia's blatant violation of international law, it cannot say that openly. Because India is reliant on Russian military equipment. About 90% of Indian Army's equipment, 40% of Navy's, and 70% of Indian Air Force's equipment comes from Russia. Most Indian helicopters are also coming from Russia. India cannot criticize Russia and still hope to receive spare parts and maintenance support from it. By reducing its reliance on imported fossil fuel, India wants to reduce its vulnerability to blackmail and increase its strategic independence. India's sunny climate and low labor costs make it one of the cheapest places in the world to produce solar. In fact, an analysis by the International Energy Agency, a watchdog think tank for energy-consuming countries, concluded that after stripping out the effects of government subsidies, only United Arab Emirates could rival it. That means solar plants are a cheaper option for new electricity generation in India than coal or gas-fired power stations. Power from windmills in India, although not the cheapest in the world, is also less expensive than that generated by burning fossil fuels. India is today the world's second most polluted country. Of the 30 most polluted cities in the world, 21 are in India in 2019. Air pollution shortens the average Indian life expectancy by 6.3 years when compared to World Health Organization standards. Some areas of India fare much worse than average, with air pollution shortening lives by over 10 years in Delhi and its surrounding regions. 248 million residents of northern India are on track to lose over eight years of life expectancy if pollution levels persist. A study published in 2019 by The Lancet, a British medical journal, found that more than one million Indians die each year because of foul air. The choking smog that blankets much of North India, especially at this time of the year, is a perennial political liability for the government. In urban areas, emissions come from vehicles and industry, whereas in rural areas, much of the pollution stems from biomass burning for cooking and keeping warm. Green energy will go a long way to solve this problem and improve the health of Indians. While these goals are admirable, there are enormous challenges that India needs to overcome to reach this goal. The first one is capital and the second is government rent. Though big Indian companies plan to invest enormous amounts, most of the 500 billion investment required to generate this much clean energy must come from foreign investors. 
and the biggest concern that foreign investors have about investing in the Indian power sector is the bad financial situation of the electricity distribution companies. Once the electricity is generated in India, it must be sold to the local government controlled distribution companies. The problem is that many of these state controlled entities are all but bankrupt with collective debts of perhaps $73 billion. Indian politicians' tendency to distribute free power to gain votes of politically powerful farmers and electricity theft are the main reasons for the enormous debts of the distribution companies. Narendra Modi's government has come up with many incentive policies to incentivize investment in clean energy. Bypassing the politically sensitive issues, Mr. Modi's government has introduced a mechanism that in effect makes India's federal government the financial backstop for new long-term contracts to provide renewable energies to the grid. It is also allowing solar and wind generators to bypass distribution companies completely to sell power directly to manufacturers of green hydrogen. India has come a long way since the days of the license run. India's rank in the World Bank's Doing Business report improved from 130 in 2016 to 63 in 2019 out of 190 countries. But starting and running a business remains difficult. From land acquisition to compliance with labor and license laws to the ever-present threat of harassment by inspectors and officials, Indian firms deal with a daunting series of challenges. These lead to inordinate delays and cost over. To overcome this, the Indian government is setting up clean energy parks with connections to the grid and speedy processing of the necessary permits. The government also uses reverse auctions to maximize investments in renewables at the lowest possible cost. That means instead of the buyers placing the bids, the sellers, that is the power developers, state the minimum price they would be prepared to accept for the power they generate, with the lowest bids winning. These government incentives seem to work. India is likely to receive offers to build generation capacity over 25 gigawatts at its solar auctions this year. That is over 10 times more than any other country. In August, it held one of the world's biggest auctions for grid-scale battery storage. Governments often make many grandiose profits. One of the strongest indicators that India's green ambitions are more than hot air is the enthusiasm of investors. Indian corporations, both large and small, are committing to clean energy in a big way. Adani Group, one of India's biggest conglomerates, is making enormous investments in renewable power in Kutch, a parched and windy region of the state of Gujarat in the west of India. With a planned output of 30 gigawatts, it will be the world's biggest combined wind and solar farm. Also, Adani Group's Mundra port, one of the world's busiest coal handling port, is also making an enormous investment in clean energy. It is home to a new solar panel factory, a pilot plant building 160 meter tall onshore wind turbines among the world's largest and new buildings where equipment to produce hydrogen will be made. Until recently, this port only served two huge coal-fired plants nearby. Investments in solar, wind and green hydrogen show the shifting priorities of big industrial groups in India. Adani Group also promised to spend $70 billion on greenery in India by 2030. With nearly 5 gigawatts of solar generation capacity as of mid-2021, Adani Green Energy, one of the group's divisions, is already on par with Italy's Enel Green as the world's leading developer of solar energy. Not to be outdone by Gautam Adani, Mr. Mukesh Ambani of the Reliance Group plans to spend $80 billion on clean energy in India. Reliance, like the Adani Group, had built its fortune in fossil fuels. But now it is developing a clean energy cluster in Jamnagar, another port city in Gujarat, which also houses the firm's massive petrochemicals complex. Mr. Mukesh Ambani plans to build 20 gigawatts of solar generation capacity by 2025, all of it to be consumed by his group for captive needs. Reliance Group's clean energy investments will cover a full spectrum stretching from the manufacturing of solar panels and batteries to the development of devices to make and use green hydrogen. 
This is what Mr. Ambani said in his latest message to his shareholders. We will have the world's most affordable green energy within this decade and these solutions will then be exported to other countries. It is not just India's joint conglomerates that are embracing Mr. Modi's green vision. Smaller companies are investing heavily too. A firm called Greenco, for instance, is building the world's biggest network of grid-scale energy storage using a technology called pumped hydro. It will use power from solar panels or windmills to pump water into elevated holding tanks. The water can then be released to turn turbines and generate power whenever electricity is needed. Mahesh Kolli, Green Co's president, says it will spend 5 billion by 2025 to construct 50 gigawatts of storage capacity. Arcelor Mittal Nippon Steel, an Indian joint venture between steel giants from Europe and Japan, has just signed a 600 million deal for Green Co to provide round the clock clean power to one of its mills. It chose this option not simply because the power will be green but because it was cheaper than building a coal-fired plant. In the longer run, Mr. Kohli sees his technology as the solution to the intermittency of power generated by wind and solar panels. He wants to build a nationwide grid-connected energy storage cloud, something similar to Amazon's data cloud. When the wind drops or the weather clouds over in Gujarat, say, the firm's pumped hydro plants in Andhra Pradesh to the south could supply a compensating amount of clean power via the national grid to aluminium smelters in Odisha to the east, run by Hindalco Industries, a big new customer. Unlike in America, which has only limited connections between regional grids, India has a much better integrated national grid, which makes such an idea feasible. The International Energy Agency projects that India will have more pumped hydro than any other country by 2026. It is early days for India's second green revolution, but the first shots have already been fired. Coal and steam power drove the industrial revolution and shaped geopolitics in the 19th century. Since then, control over the production of and trade in oil has been a key feature of 20th century power policy. A once-in-a-century transition from fossil fuels to alternative energy is currently happening in the 21st century, and India is well-placed to lead the transition. The West had a 100-year head start in the conventional automotive industry. It has been a long, hard slog for Indian firms to catch up and compete. In many areas of clean technology, by contrast, India suffers no comparable disadvantage. As a result, India will do for hydrogen what China did for batteries. If you like such macroeconomic videos, I recommend you watch this video on the Indian economy where I analyze its trends. I'm Sharat Mantravadi. Thanks for watching.